And this is work you did, you said 1979? 1979. Wow. Work for hire. One shot story done as kind of a, a joke. And was that an opportunity that was an interesting thing where you, you know, someone else might have turned it down or no, this was something that you were doing well, on Well, no, this business. was just, an, I, was at a, I was at another party <laughs> at, at Rick Oberg's, the artist's house, and the artist was there. I mean, the, um, the editor, Roy Thomas, was there. And we were, Rick and I, was, we were just kind of coming up with all these crazy ideas for potential what-if stories. And I, I don't even know who came up with the idea. I think it was me. I said, what if Thor, was, the hammer was found by Jane Foster? And we were, you know, we were having a couple of drinks, we were a little bit loose, you know, we're coming up with crazier and crazy ideas. And we went up to Roy and said, hey, what, about, what do you think of this? Because he turned down a bunch of the ones we came up with. And he said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Run with it. So the next day, I was busy working out the story. And um, see, in those, in, at Marvel, the, the way you write, wrote a story was different. Every company had their own method. When I worked at, uh, when I'm working now, doing these Shudder and Vampirus Carmilla stories, you write a script, like a movie script, pretty much. You describe everything and give everybody dialogue. When I worked at Gold Key Comics, it was more. You got sent down with a sheet, because they were used to working with cartoonists. So you got a sheet of paper, and you ruled off with a ruler where the panels would go, and then you would write in each rectangle or square what was going on. And if you, and if you went, went off beyond the line, you know you got too much on the page. With Marvel, you would talk to the artist. You would write up a, a synopsis. The synopsis might be one paragraph or two paragraphs. And you give it to the artist, and the artist would draw it up any way he wants. And then you would get the art back, and you would get these penciled, you know, like a fight that would have gone for four pages, where in your synopsis, all you write was, they fight. And the artist kind of came up with all that. And then you write all the balloons and the captions and the sound effects over the artwork. And then the inker and the letter would come, and they would edit, letter the artwork and... Um, and ink in the, the artwork, and then, then color it. So it was like working backwards in a way. So each company had their own way of doing it. With the dialogue that you submit, is the artwork then matched exactly page by page, frame by frame? Well, that's a really good question. <clears throat> and a lot of writers don't understand it, or artists. When you write a regular script, in script form, you don't know where the you don't see any artwork, it's not done yet. When you do it um, the gold key fashion, they would, you would get the script, and before the artwork was even done, they would draw in balloons, and the artist would have to work around where the balloons were to fit the artwork in. Marvel style, which is the easiest way, I thought, when you wrote a synopsis, and then they came, they sent you the penciled artwork, and there's no artwork, there's no uh, inks yet, and there's no dialogue, and there's no text at all, then you write the text to fit the artwork. And the art, first of all, the artist has to leave you room to put text someplace. Then you've got to put the artwork, the, 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 the text, so the reader reads it in the correct sequence. You can't have a question answer, asked here, and the answer asked, someplace over here with something in between where there's somebody's talking. It's got to follow. You got to follow it like you're a conversation. And then the art, you, the, you as a writer have to place, taking all that into account, you have to place the balloons and things so it doesn't cover up an important piece of artwork. You don't want to have a character who's talking have the balloon over his face. It's got to be from some dead space or whatever. That's a trick. It took me a while to learn that. And a lot of artists and writers don't know how to do that. It's, a, it's just a, a knack you pick up after a while. So you're seeing the artwork already laid out? Yeah, when you, when you, when you work for Marvel, except they, they have done an occasion script, you know, writing a full script. Generally at Marvel, you write a synopsis. And it might be, Captain America fights Doctor Doom. It for possession of a magic thing of some sort. You know, during the fight, 
Captain America loses a shield. You know, very general things like that. Then what you get, usually in the old days, it was in the mail, it came in the mail in a big envelope like this, was the artwork penciled on big sheets of some kind of board, and then you would write your script. You might see a panel that looks really great by itself. Why ruin it with putting dialogue in? Let's just leave it as is. And you don't know until you see the artwork. Then they send it back, and it gets lettered, and then an anchor comes in and he inks it. And um, it's a different, it's, it's a way of being able to mass produce these things like on an assembly line. While one person is lettering it, the other person is writing it, somebody else is drawing it. And you can do, you can work a lot faster that way. The only time in recent years, I mean, recent decades actually, that it was actually a thrill seeing my name on anything for something I'd done. There's a new movie that just came out called Thor, Love and Thunder. It's based on the idea that Dr. Don Blake, who traditionally, traditionally became Thor in the comic books, didn't, that, that it was actually his nurse and girlfriend, Jane Foster, who became Thor. That was inspired by a comic book story that I wrote and that artist Rick Holberg drew in 1979 uh, for a, comic, a Marvel comic called What If? And we're coming up with all these silly ideas. What if Spider-Man had two heads or something? You know? And one of them was, what if Jane Foster found the hammer of Thor and became Thor? It was a one-shot, never intended to go beyond that one issue of What If? And, and thought it was kind of a half joke. Well, in recent years, somebody picked up on that idea in the comic books, in the Marvel comics, and it's become part of the mainstream continuity to the extent where they decided to make a movie out of this, hundreds of millions of dollar movie. Well, Marvel was really good. Marvel remembered Rick Hoberg and, my, and myself for this. They um, invited us to the screen, the, the world premiere at Grauman's Chinese Theater, we got to walk the red carpet and all that. And uh, they paid us, I won't say how much, but they paid us very handsomely. And they didn't have to do this. Remember, this is a work for hire. The storyline was almost nothing of what, what I came up with, it, except the ending was a little bit the same. But it was mostly, they just took the idea of Jane Foster becoming Thor, that was it. And we're sitting there at Grauman's Chinese Theater, looking at the IMAX screen, and our name comes up at the end in the end credits. That was a big deal. That was a really big deal. Um, so I'm grateful. I'm really thankful for Mar to Marvel for doing that. People who worked for the companies like Marvel and DC, and always complaining they were ripped off, never remembered, never given any money, never given any credit. And I got to say, Marvel came through for us. We didn't even ask them. I asked them at one point, is it possible this will ever happen? That we'll get some kind of recognition out of this? And all they said was, we'll see, we'll get back to you. And they got back to us in a very nice way. So I'm really grateful and thankful. And seeing your name on the IMAX screen at Grauman's Chinese Theater with all the footprints outside in the front lobby was a big deal.